you standing, I want you to say this with me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for the remainder of our time. I pray, God, that you would speak clearly, powerfully, directly to every single one of us. That it would not just be information, but it would be revelation. That it would come from your spirit. It would come from your heart. It would come from your mind, God. Father, I pray that you would remove anything that would distract people. God, that you would help us to open our hearts and help us to receive. Let it stick to us. Get in us. May it grow and create transformation and change. Father, I pray that you would allow me the privilege to stand in your heart and be your mouthpiece. Father, I thank you this is a demon-free zone. I thank you that Jesus is the Lord of this church. Holy Spirit, you are the primary teacher. God, we give you praise for everything. In Jesus' name, you agree with that? Say amen. God bless you as you're seated. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is where I want you to go. I want to talk to you around the thought identity crisis. We live in one of the most turbulent, chaotic, fearful times I think that we have ever experienced in our lifetime. If I were to ask you the question, who are you? You may tell me what you do. You may tell me you're a professional, you're, uh, this is your occupation. You might tell me the neighborhood you're from, where you grew up. You would tell me what you do for most of you. Very few of you would actually answer the question that was asked, who are you? What you do and who you are isn't always the same. If you would ask a teenager, many teenagers in early 20s right now, they would respond to that question with some type of noun. They wouldn't say, this is who I am. They would make reference to a gender identity. And in the world that we live in, that's a term that's called fluid, meaning that things are subject to change. That's not God's definition, but that's the way many people would respond. Even in the church world, there seems to be this absence of people being aware of who God created them to be. There's an identity crisis. One of the first things that I recognized when I became a Christian was the, the, the most important thing for me to do was to go to work on my mind in the way I thought. That was one of the greatest revelations when I first became, became a Christian was that I did not have to think every thought that I thought. And I didn't have to be subject to the thoughts and the feelings that I had. That I just, I could do something about it. In Romans chapter 6, and I would encourage you to go back and read Romans chapter 6 later. In Romans chapter 6, it describes what happens when you get saved, when you give your life to Jesus Christ. When you repent of your sins, you call on his name, you're born again, and now you're a child of God. It describes the powers of sin being broken. But you're no longer a slave to sin. You're freed from the powers of sin. Sin no longer has legal right to hold on to you. Doesn't mean that people don't find themselves struggling with certain sins because most certainly they do. But the reality is some people are walking around taken captive by sins that no longer have legal right to occupy their life. Simply because they don't know who they are. In Romans chapter 6, it describes it being baptized into the death of Christ. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, like I described, you're baptized into him. And it says you're baptized into his death. Meaning the old you that used to live is now put to death, no longer lives or exists in you. You may be wondering why it is the old you need to be put to death and why does there need to be a new you that comes to life? Because the old you was conceived in iniquity, born into sin. We all came into this world with a sin nature. Every one of us was broken 
as we've lived life in this world without Christ. We were born broken. We live broken. And the only way for God to deal with your brokenness is to put to death the old you and to give you a new life. That's why it's called being born again. Because the old you was broken. The new you is perfect. So scripture says we've been baptized into the body of Christ. There are three baptisms in scripture. I've taught you this before. Hebrews chapter 6 says the doctrine of baptisms, plural, there's three. There's the baptism into the body of Christ. When you get saved, you now are baptized by his spirit into his body. We become his hands. We become his feet. He places us in the body where he wills. His desire is for us to become an expression of him, for us to live out of that identity that is now discovered in Christ so there's that baptism there's baptism in water then there's a baptism with the Holy Spirit in fire you need to experience all three baptisms but we're just talking about the baptism into the body of Christ when you get born again your old nature it is now washed away it does not exist but that doesn't mean you don't find yourself struggling with some of the things that you used to struggle with 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become brand new. So if all things become brand new and I'm a new creation, then why do I find myself struggling with some of the old things that I struggled with before I became the new me that I now am in Christ? It's because you've got to renew your mind. We lived our whole life living a certain way prior to coming to Christ, and all of that is programmed who we've become. The family you grew up in, the neighborhood you grew up in, all of the things that are part of this world have worked to try to influence who you are. The devil, your flesh, and this world are working to try to alienate you from God, to keep you out of an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, to separate you from your identity in Christ so that you can be more easily victimized and manipulated. Everything has a plan for you. Everything has a plan for you. You go buy a home. The mortgage company has a plan for you. You open up a magazine, there are plans in there that people have for you. You get, you get an internet subscription, there is a plan for you. Everybody has a plan for you, but it seems that very few people understand God's plan for them. They never discover their identity, so therefore they're always living or subject to live their life being influenced by either the devil, the flesh, or this world. Scripture says in Psalms chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. And I'll, I'll be in 2 Corinthians in a minute. But it says blessed is the man. You want to know how to be blessed. Yes. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Nor stands in the paths of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law or the word of the Lord. And in his word he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water and that brings forth fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. Notice the progression, the downward spiral of walking and standing and sitting. He who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, we refer to counsel today as going to a therapist or a psychiatrist or, or maybe somebody at the church. We're going to go get counseling. But counsel is anything that influences your decision-making process. God gave you a good mind. He expects you to use it. I believe the reason that God birthed this in me, this message in me, for a time such as this is because it's probably never been more important to pay attention about what you think about than ever before. 
Because the thoughts that you think on, the thoughts that get in you, ultimately will be the thoughts that control you. You are a product of your thinking. He said, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Be careful what is influencing your walk. The world and the devil and your flesh are trying to influence your decision making process so that your walk will come to a standstill. He goes from walking to standing in the paths of sinners. When I'm walking somewhere, I only stop and stand when something gets my attention. Be careful what gets your attention because what gets your attention begins to, begins to work its way into your heart. What you stop and connect to has the ability to actually affect what you become. You go from walking to standing to sitting. It's amazing how, how the, the, whether it's the world, whether it's the devil, or whether it's your flesh, how it can take you down through this process of ending up sitting. When you sat down a few moments ago, you sat down because you plan on taking a little bit of time right here. It's like I'm going to spend some time here. I'm going to sit down because I want to stay right here just for a little bit. It says sitting in the seat of the scornful. Scornful means mockers. They're mockers. Have you run into people that used to be on fire but now make fun of you for being on fire? Uh, they used to be passionate about God and now they make fun of you for being passionate about God. Alienated from God's plan. Lost touch of who God's called them to be. Because of the influence, the counsel of the ungodly, it led them down. I'm, I'm being influenced and now I'm standing and ultimately end up sitting. But he said, but the man that meditates in God's word, and the word meditate is not like Eastern religion or any other type of meditation that you may experience through yoga or something else like that. That is not scriptural meditation. The word meditate in the Bible never means to check your brain out and put it in neutral. The reason so many people are being deceived and controlled today is because they put their minds in neutral. There is something called information fatigue. We have intentionally been bombarded by the enemy over the last 12 months for the purpose of creating information fatigue. When you get so much information coming at you that creates confusion, and scripture says, where confusion is, every evil thing is at work. When the enemy begins to create confusion, it's because he's really at work doing something. Not only does it create confusion, but information fatigue is actually fear-monging for the purpose of controlling people by fear, paralyzing them. And what happens under information fatigue is people get so fatigued that they just actually lay down and subject themselves to whatever's going to happen happens. But we are citizens of God's kingdom. Our identity is not in the world. Our identity is who we've been born into. We walk out our salvation from the position that we've been given in the spirit. We have been born again and placed in the body of Christ. It's out of our position that we do our living. It's out of the body of Christ. It's out of the spirit we do our living. That's why it's so important that you pay attention to the thoughts that get into your mind. And you know what to do with those thoughts once they get into your mind. So those thoughts don't end up taking you out of your position and robbing you of your identity. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh... Now, the flesh isn't talking about the physical body. It's talking about your carnal nature. 
It's talking about the unregenerated old you that you used to be. The mindset, everything that was programmed into you by living in this world without Christ when you walked in the counsel of the ungodly. All of that stuff is in your mind. When you get saved and got saved, only your spirit got saved. Doesn't mean you're not saved. But your soul is being saved. And ultimately you will be saved. You're saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved. So your soul, your mind, your mind is part of your soul. If you don't understand this right here, you will always be subject and controlled by your thought life. Your thoughts shouldn't control you, you should control your thoughts. Your mind doesn't control you. You control your mind. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and to the obedience of Christ. This is the goal, to bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. To get to a place where we recognize every thought that doesn't line up with the will of God. Anytime a thought enters your mind, being able to recognize that thought's an unhealthy thought. That thought's an ungodly thought. That thought does not come from God. And if I give place to that thought, that thought will lead to another thought, to another thought that will turn into an action that will ultimately lead me in a direction that I discover I did not want to go. We'll be controlled by the world or by the devil or by our flesh. These things will control us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It starts with having knowledge. Some people say, I wish I knew the will of God. I wish I knew God's plan for my life. I wish I knew what God wanted me to do right now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 said, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. In the world we're living in right now, setting your your life aside is more important than ever before. Sanctification simply means I'm not going to allow my life to be used for everything and anything the world wants to use my life for. They may have a plan for my life, but it doesn't mean I have to submit my life to their plan for my life. I remember a long time ago, God God told me this. He said, Jay, I have a plan for you, but you got to understand the devil's got one too. What you submit to will determine which plan is at work in your life. The weapons of our warfare, not carnal. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. So important that you do whatever you got to do to begin to fill up your mind with knowledge. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But it doesn't mean just knowing it because you heard it. It means so knowing it that it creates an action. I know the truth. I know, it, I know the truth, and I know it to such a level that it's going to influence my decision-making process, my behavior, the way I live, the way I walk. I am not going to do everything and anything that people want me to do or that thoughts come into my mind to do. I am going to make the conscious decision that I am going to walk according to the will of God for my life. That's what sanctified means. Sanctification means I'm not going to do everything. I'm only going to do some things and I'm only going to do the things that God has called me to do. That's the goal. 
The goal is to recognize unhealthy thoughts as soon as they enter into your mind. When you recognize them entering into your mind, you don't just passively sit there. You resist them. You take authority over them. You pull those things down in the name of Jesus. When those thoughts get into your mind, you say, you say, in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to let that thought stay there. I'm going to bind it up and I'm going to pull it down. I'm not going to let it occupy one more moment of my mind. I'm getting rid of it in the name of Jesus. You can put two people in the same environment and one person it will destroy and another person will flourish. Remember the story of when David ended up killing Goliath? David walks down there to bring his brothers some food, and his brothers were in the army of the Lord. They had on their soldiers, uh, their soldiers, their uniforms, because they were soldiers. Twice a day, Goliath would come down, and he would challenge them. And every time they would run backwards up onto the top of the hill, they would retreat from Goliath. They were viewing Goliath through Goliath's eyes. They formed an opinion about themselves based off on who Goliath said he was. Here comes David. He walks down and he sees what's taking place. But David did not view Goliath through the lenses of who Goliath is. David viewed Goliath through the lenses of who God is. David's looking at God and looking at Goliath. Looking at God and looking at Goliath. All the other soldiers, they're looking at Goliath and looking at themselves. Looking at Goliath and looking at themselves. David's over here looking at God and looking at Goliath. Looking at God and looking at Goliath. They are over here looking at Goliath and looking at themselves. Looking in their life. We're pulling back because they're looking at Goliath and looking at themselves. But David wasn't evaluating whether he was strong enough. David knew that if God be for you, who can be against you? It's not about my power. It's about his power. And so David did what any of them could have done, but they didn't do it because of the way they thought. The way people think will determine what happens. Wrong thoughts in our minds will take us captive and lead us into a place that alienates us from God. What do you do with wrong thoughts? Here's what you do. You repent. Many people have reviewed, I mean, looked at the word repent as if somehow it's an angry expression coming from God. But the word repent means to change your mind. You know you have the right to change your mind? You can't even repent without changing your mind. I repented, but you didn't change your mind. Look up the word repent. Look up the definition of it in the biblical, in the Bible dictionary and see what it tells you. It's a change of thinking. That's why it's so important to renew your mind. The apostle Paul said in, in, in uh, Ephesians, is it, no, excuse me, Hebrews chapter six, or no, Romans chapter six. I'll get it all down in just a moment. It's somewhere in the neighborhood. And, uh, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and pleasing to God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, that you renew your minds, that you don't think on every thought that comes into you, but you actually set your life aside. You set your mind aside so that you can live by God's will for your life. Scripture says, put off the old man. When it says put off the old man, it's saying put off your old way of thinking. Change the way you think. Put on the new man. And how do you put on the new man? You put on the new man by renewing your mind with the word of God. That's how you put on the new man. So when those thoughts come into your mind, you take them captive, you pull them down so that those unhealthy thoughts don't ultimately sidetrack you and take you into a place that will destroy your life. They become strongholds. 
Strongholds are what the enemy will use to control you. So whether you got free from heroin or you need to get free from gossiping, and if you're a gossiper, you need to get free from gossiping. Gossiping is a greater sin than heroin addiction. Because that's what self-righteous religious people do. They, they, they sit in their goodness looking down their nose at the heroin addict struggling and they gossip about him not realizing that that's more evil than the person saying, God, deliver me from heroin. So breaking out of all this isn't necessarily easy. That's why we have to press the Apostle Paul said, I press toward the goal. I press toward the mark. I press toward the thing that God has for me. I'm not going to stay right where I am. I'm going to go higher. Your mind always gets there before you get there. I refuse to entertain the negative thoughts of this world. I refuse to entertain the negative thoughts that come from the enemy. I refuse to entertain negative thoughts that come from other people that would try to always point out the reasons why things can't be or why things can't become or why it has to be a certain way. I refuse to to entertain those thoughts. I fill my mind with the promises of God. I look at things that seem like they're not, and I call them as though they are. If you could see me when you're not around, what I say, because I say what's going to happen way before it ever happens. I'm talking about it. I'm praying it. I'm declaring it. I'm prophesying it. I'm decreeing it. I decree it over my family. I decree it over my wife. I decree it over my children. I decree it over my finances. I decree it over the church. I decree it over you. I decree it over this region. I decree it over Orange County, we will not be taken captive by the end time strategies of the world. We will be carriers of revival. We carry fire. We'll get people saved. We'll get people redeemed. We will be light. We will be salt. We are the righteousness of God. We are more than conquerors. We are totally victorious. We are overcomers in Christ. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am blessed coming in. I am blessed coming out. The goodness and mercy of God follows me all the days of my life. You cannot curse what God has blessed. You got to begin to say it before you see it. So many people are taken captive by what they think. They're taken captive by their thoughts. They're taken captive by their thoughts. They walk by what they see. And they call what they see as though it is. And I'm not saying that we're to live in denial. But what I'm saying is we speak to things that are not the way they're supposed to be. I'm telling you, God is going to do something so powerful through your life and through us that it's going to be hard to go to hell from Southern California. God is going to pour out his spirit on this region. He's going to pour out his spirit on Orange County. He's going to pour out his spirit on Los Angeles. He's going to pour out his spirit in this whole region. God is going to move in this region. The devil's going to have to back up. Power's going to have to back up. That's why the enemy wants to try to keep you isolated. That's one of the enemy's biggest tricks. If he can separate and isolate you, you're, you're an easier target for him. That's why it's so important that we gather together, that we get into the word of God, that we position ourselves under preaching because it's the preaching of God that convinces men. There's an impartation. You have to understand, this isn't like some university class. I realize if you've had previous church experience, there's a lot of good churches, but there's some that are just dead. They're like a lecture. They're like a lecture in some university, sending some course, giving you some history lesson. But when you're under the preaching of the anointed word of God, there's an impartation. Faith is built up. Faith rises up on the inside of you. The fire begins to be flamed on the inside of you. So the enemy doesn't want you to get into the word of God. He wants to keep you out of God's word. 
Because you know what this is? This is combustible material. It's hard to have a fire without any materials. You got to have some fuel. You can't start a fire with no fuel. That's what this is. This is fuel. The Word of God's fuel. Psalm 119 said, How can a man cleanse his ways by paying attention to the Word of God? The world tried to tell us to do one. You know, I had a bunch of friends that I've been friends with for over 20 years, maybe 30 years. Over the last 12 months, they quit being my friend. We didn't get in arguments. They just said, I don't know about Jay. Look at what he's doing. I didn't attack them. I didn't condemn them. But they slowly backed away and said, we're not his friend. That, that, that doesn't bother me. But what I'm telling you is that in these days that we live in, you better know what you believe. Because everybody, everybody's trying to gaslight everybody. Everybody's trying to throw demonic fuel on everybody and try to convince you that you are what they say you are. You're this, you're that. They try to convince you. No, I am not anything anybody says I am. I'm everything he says I am. I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. That's who I am. I am who God says I am. People can get off in the little corners and say, well, I think he's this and I think he's that. You can think who I am and you can say who I am all you want. But I'm going to look at God. I'm going to look at Goliath. I'm going to look at God. I'm going to look at Goliath. Some people over here, I'm looking at Goliath and I'm looking at me. I'm looking at Goliath and I'm looking at you. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place right now. I feel the power of God in this place right now. You know another reason? You know another reason? You know another reason, Al? Come here. Come, come stand right here, Al. Come right here. Watch this. So stand right there. You know a reason the enemy tries to keep people separated and isolated? Because the enemy knows what he, Hebrews chapter 4 says. That God supplies based on our connections. God supplies based on our connections. What he carries now flows into me. What I carry now flows into him. It's through connections. The enemy don't want people connected. That's why we're starting watch parties with people in people's living rooms, developing communities all across America. And if you're watching from a prison cell because you got a phone in there illegally, thank God you're using it. Thank God you're using it to tap into this moment right here. Phones can be very expensive inside in prison. Won't you stay standing? There are people in this room you recognize that there are thoughts that have been trying to take you captive. There are thoughts that have been trying to sabotage your success. How many people in this room recognize there are think thoughts in your mind that are trying to take you captive? I want you to get out of your seat and come to this altar right now. I want you to get out of your seat and come to this altar right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Father, yeah, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Woo! Woo! Lay your hand. 
hand on your head right now. Say this with me. Say in the name of Jesus. I pull down every ungodly thought. My thought is, my mind is redeemed. It's covered in the blood of Jesus. I command every lie to go in Jesus' name. I am a child of God. I will serve God. I will serve Him with my mind, with my heart, with my life. In the authority of Jesus' name, I break every lie. I take authority over every lie. I bind it up and pull it down in the name of Jesus. Touch people right now, God. Let your power touch people. Let your anointing touch people. Every stronghold broken, every lie broken. Everything broken in Jesus' name. Every lie broken in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, touch people right now, God. Touch people right now, God. Touch people right now, God. Touch people, Lord. In the name of Jesus, touch. Touch. Freedom in your name, Jesus. Freedom in your name, Jesus. Freedom in Jesus' name. 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 Touch people right now, God. Holy Spirit, touch people. Touch their minds. Touch their minds. Touch their minds. Every stronghold broken. Every stronghold pulled, pulled down in the name of Jesus. Every vain imagination pulled down. Every argument pulled down. Cast down in the name of Jesus. Broken, 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 broken. Broken in the authority of Jesus' name. Broken in the name of Jesus. Freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom in your name, Jesus. Just begin to thank God for freedom. Begin to praise Him for your freedom. Begin to praise Him for your freedom. Begin to thank Him for your freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Thank you for changing my life, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just thank you for what He's doing in the life. Thank you, God. Woo. Thank you, Father. Thank Jesus. Come on, just thank Him. Begin to thank Him, thank Him, thank Him, thank Him. Touch, touch right now, God. Touch it. Touch it in your name, Jesus. Touch it. Freedom in your name, Jesus. 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 Freedom. 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 Freedom in your name, Jesus. Robo la bakatara basakatara basata. Woo! Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
We want a fresh start from you. We believe you are doing a new thing. You are doing a new thing. Thank you, God. Woo! Thank you, God. God. Continue to move, God. Move among us. Let your power, your presence your flow among us, God. Touch people. Touch people, Father. Touch people, Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Woo! More Jesus. Woo! Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, release your power. Let your power continue to flow, God. Release your power. Let it flow, Father. Your power. Let it flow, Father. Your anointing. Let it flow, Father. Woo! Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Woo! Thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. Lord, I pray revival fire will just continue to increase. Revival fire, Lord, never going out. Never going out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm not releasing people from this. When you need to go, you're free to go, but you can go in this. And then when you come back, we're going to meet right back, right here where we are in God's presence. We're going to go higher. We're going to keep going higher. We're going to keep ministering to people as long as people need to be ministered to.